to be able to express that religious belief mm -hmm. in the way that we are convinced we ought to be able to express it in. And I think we have to give, we have really to be thankful. I am first thankful to God, but I'm also thankful to the country and to its system of laws, regulations, its constitution that allows us to be able to express the beliefs that we hold there. I said earlier that I recognize and accept that Rastafarianism is a religion. It is not a religion that I'm a part of, but I recognize in my own views on Rastafarianism over time. Uh, decolonization is the way I put it, of my own mind. I have not stood to my feet to denounce anybody. I recognize, and I think the Honorable Member for St. James Central would have spoken to the first time he encountered Rastafarians and the kinds of comments that were made about their appearance, about their lifestyle. And we really have seen a change in perception over time. The reason why, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am very, very sensitive to how people, to the situations that confront people who practice religion is because as a Sunday Adventist, when I was also a little boy, I had to suffer, well, I, didn't call, I won't call it suffer, but I, I, I think there was a certain indignity. I remember being called a seven devil. I remember that very clearly in this country. Seven devil. I remember being called that. And I am so, I've become very sensitive to the practice of religion. I've also had to encounter situations where pressure was attempted to be sent my way because there are certain things I will not do between sunset on a Friday evening and sunset on a Saturday evening. And I don't even want to use the term come hell or high water because this is a religious discussion and I'm not introducing hell into the discussion. But, and that's the reason why I'm speaking now. <laughs> because there are certain things I'm not going to do and I'm not going to accept anybody putting pressure on me to act in a way that goes against what my conscience right. asks me to do as a person who is practicing my faith. And so, as I see, as I saw how Rastafarians were treated, I could identify to a degree. Because to be truthful and to be fair, we were not treated with the same disdain as they were. Right. But we were not seen as main, mainstream either. I've been called a member of a cult. These are all things that smaller religious organizations have to confront. And I am happy that we have come to the point in our country and in our country's growth and maturity that we can now speak to the country and say to the country that we will no longer allow Rastafarians to be discriminated against because of the way they look, the way they dress. You, you know, <laughs> all kinds of jokes used to be made. I'm a vegetarian, I eat fish, but I'm a vegetarian generally. And you know that all kinds of jokes used to be made with Rastafarians about going out of their cellars and finding corned beef tins. All kinds of disparaging things. I, I'm, I'm surprised that you're reaction, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because you are much more senior than I, I thought you'd heard. I've heard, heard that one, though. <laughs> but I've heard of, those are the kinds of jokes, mm. I think are unfortunate, that are made when speaking to Rastafarians and Rastafarian communities and how, how they've developed. We have a situation in this world and in, in the country as well. We're now that movie stars have adopted a vegan lifestyle. Veganism is now becoming mainstream. But because a man or a woman with natties, with dreads, 
espouse the same lifestyle, it is seen as some kind of extreme yeah. position. You know, where you, you, you can't eat no meat, you know, what's going on in your head? You know, what was wrong with you? A good piece of chicken from one of these places. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to hear you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but... Yeah. You don't hear us say... I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing the pork asides. But I think that once we are seeing a change in views, a change in beliefs, a change in practice of lifestyle, because certain people have now adopted the lifestyle, I believe that the test of the character of a nation is how it treats to the less vulnerable, well, not to, yeah, to, the, to the vulnerable, to the more vulnerable, to the marginalized, to the weak, to those who have not been given voice. That, to me, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is the test of the maturity of a country. And I believe that what we've come here today to do speaks to the maturing of our country. So that now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the colors of Rastafari are accepted. People like to wear bracelets and stuff. The music is accepted, reggae. The liturgy is more accepted than it used to be. I think it speaks to the fact that we have become more accepting of Africa as our mother country. It's become, we are more accepting that those things that are Afrocentric are not bad, are not backward, are not from some bygone era or some extreme. And so we see, as was mentioned earlier, and I, in St. Philip the Less Church in St. Bell, drums are used, an Anglican church. There is in the liturgy and the practice of religious services in more mainstream churches, the churches that are called mainstream churches, an understanding that there are aspects of our African heritage that can be incorporated into our practice of our religions and our denominations, even if those religious practices or, or those denominations are not originating yeah. on the continent. So we understand that there is no inherent evil, because that used to be the view. Mm -hmm. There is no inherent evil. There are practices that we can follow, adopt, use. I would want just to mention that, you know, in scripture, there is no description of God in terms of physical characteristics. But there is a passage, a few verses in the first chapter of Revelation that speaks to, as far as my study goes, the only physical representation of God, except spirit and light, those are things that, terms that are used in scripture. But in Revelation 1, somewhere around 14, 15, somewhere around there, there is mention of God, and we are given a bit of a visual. Here, like wool. And our understanding of that is not long and straight as many of the pictures would depict. And I myself have issues with, with some of my people sometimes with these depictions. The feet are described as the color of burnished brass. Sounds to me like dark. And I, I would just want to, I, I've not come to preach a sermon, but I just thought I needed to share that yeah. to allow, because I believe that these, Mr. Deputy Speaker, are learning experiences and teaching experiences. And I would just want to say to those who are a little bit uncomfortable with ascribing things Africa to good and to religion, to say to them that from scripture, they may have to do some rethinking. 
I believe that rights that have been given to people, such as the rights conferred on us by our Constitution, are meant to allow us to practice freely once that practice does not infringe the rights of others, once it does not cause public harm, so that the matter, I think I heard this morning, the matter of child sacrifices has no, no place in the practice of any religion in any kind of society. What we've come to speak to today does not, in my mind, rise to a level that speaks to public harm in the execution of a private or a corporate expression of religious practice. And so the matter of sacramental use of cannabis is in my mind not infringing on any other rights. Therefore, I accept and believe and affirm and support the view that Rastafarians ought to be allowed to use cannabis in their sacramental rights. In our manifesto, we spoke, and I, I'm not saying this now okay. to cast any slur, Major. but in our manifesto, we spoke to the medicinal use of marijuana, of cannabis. We have had our debate on that. In our manifesto, we also spoke to the recreational use of cannabis. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, in that manifesto, we made it quite clear that any decision on the recreational use of cannabis must be sent to referendum. I, Mr. Deputy Speaker, signed up to that, like all 30 members of this honorable chamber, I signed up to that. I do not remember if the paper was blank or not, but I signed up to that. And I hold to that. And I want, in spite of what the public may have heard through these deliberations in more recent times, to say to the public that the party of which I am a part holds to that clause in our manifesto. We have placed it there. We understand that our manifesto is a commitment that we are making to the public of Barbados. We are not a party that does any sleight of hand, any smoke and mirrors, who tries any backdoor stuff to get things done. That is not the nature of the Barbados Labour Party. It has never been the nature of the Barbados Labour Party. And those who have been, those who are members of the Barbados Labour Party, and those who up to 18 months ago were members of the Barbados Labour Party, or those who up to 18 weeks ago were members of the Barbados Labour Party, understand that that is not the Labour Party way. We don't tell the public one thing and then do a 180 on them. Okay. It, it is just not in our DNA. We, we see it as a contract. We see it as a contract. And so I just want to reassure those who may be at the top of Broad Street or the middle of Swan Street, those few people who, who listen to um, certain people, just to reassure them that this is no gimmickry. This is no backdoor attempt at anything. This is a process of removing a restriction on people who want to practice their religion, just like how I, as a Sunday Adventist, want to be able to practice mine. That is all we are doing with this bill. Now, I, I, I want to be very clear this evening. I do not and will not accept that any public makes any determination 
on how I practice my religion. In other words, there may be one or two persons who believe that the sacramental use of cannabis should also have gone to public referendum. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would walk out of this parliament if the party that I'm a part of had intended to do that. Because no public, I am not walking about Barbados begging people to allow me to worship on Sabbath. No legitimate religion should have to go into the public space and beg people to allow them to practice their religion in the way they see fit. And so I would never, under any circumstances, join with anybody to ask Barbadians, except the people who we are specifically targeting or facilitating, I would not join with anybody, any party, any group to ask the wider public to say, yes, I will allow you to do that. That has no place in modern practice of religion or how we go about dealing with religious expression. In 1969, this country disestablished the church. And so those of us who sit here do not sit as representatives of churches. I am a Sunday Adventist. My belief system is rooted in Adventism. I stand here as an Adventist, but representing the people in Rosal, Spikestown, Bostabel, Black Best, all over St. Peter. Those are the people I represent while I'm here, well guided by my belief system. But I say that to say to you and to say to the chamber, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that Barbados is not a theocracy. There is a role for the church, and I believe strongly that there's a role for the church. There is a role for my church. There is a role for the church that I was fortunate to worship in, in Hinesbury Road. And there's a role for churches all over Barbados. And I really want to call on religious institutions to take that role seriously, to continue to take it seriously, and to continue to work hard to impact our communities, to continue to work hard to impact our societies. I also want to say to them, and I'm a part of them, not to be phased when people say or suggest that the church is not doing anything. Because I have said it here before, a lot of those people, and I am saying this now without fear or favor, because I can't remember who said it, but a lot of those people ain't got no business in church, they don't send their children to church, they don't go to church, they, they don't care about church, but want church to work miracles for communities and societies. I don't buy that. I don't buy that. So when I hear that kind of illusion, I write it off completely. But that said, I would still want to say to faith-based organizations, not just churches, but all faith-based organizations, that we have a responsibility to our communities. Right. And so in spite of those criticisms, we have to keep our focus, keep our head down, and do all that we can to make sure that we continue the work of building good societies in this country. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have never smoked, injected, drunk cannabis, marijuana, never drink. in any form, <laughs> in any form at all. I also have never drunk alcohol. <laughs> I say that to say the following. <laughs> Just like I do not, I would not stand in this chamber and say to anybody that it is wrong for the honorable member for the city to go to James Street and take communion that is alcohol or alcohol-based, <laughs> by the same token, I will not say 
to the Rastafarians who worship down St. Andrew that they should not use cannabis in their sacrament. In other words, even if the sacrament is not something that I agree should be put into my body, I will not object to a group of believers having that practice if they believe that that is what their belief system is calling for. If I did, then I would be standing to ask that all sacrament wine in Christian communion should be non-alcoholic because that is what I believe personally, mm. that it should be non-alcoholic. Mm. But there are not many who agree with me. <laughs> I, all I'm saying is that the fact that I do not believe that, I, that cannabis should be smoked or that alcohol should be drunk does not stop me from being of the mind that says as a country, as a legislature, as a legislature, that we have to allow people to practice their religion according to the dictates of their character. And I believe that is fundamental to the freedom of religion and to the freedom of religious expression. I support temperance in all things. As a matter of fact, when the Seventh-day Adventist Church was established, we had a strong arm called the temperance movement. And sometimes in more modern times, we call it abstinence from that which is bad and the moderate use of that which is good. I support the crafting of this bill in a way that speaks to the amounts that are mentioned. The learned attorney general, the honorable member for St. Joseph, detailed that in his presentation. I support it, and I support it primarily because I think that whether a thing is good or bad, or whether I believe a thing is good or bad, they should not just be, well, in food we call it gluttony. Other words may be used in other situations. But I support the use of quantums to guide our approach to allowing cannabis for sacramental purposes. There are limits to the amounts, limits to the locations, and, you know, <laughs> It is said that common sense is not common. And I wonder sometimes when I hear about a person being allowed to have cannabis for sacramental purposes, but no thought given as to how the person will have it, will, will come into possession of it. And so the Honorable Attorney General spoke to that this morning, because there is still that thought and talk about not being able to, to have it in your possession, but to allow for sacramental use. I, the grape juice that we use in church, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have to buy it. And even though as a church we believe in miracles, I have never seen a bottle of grape juice just appear one Sabbath morning for our communion service. We, we have to get it from somewhere. Now, I do not think that it is beyond us as a country, our capacity to our capacity to manage a situation. It is not beyond our capacity to regulate in some form what we have placed in this bill. To say that we could not 
would be really to say that we have no business even being a state. We should still be a colony somewhere. We have the capacity to manage our affairs. And we have managed much more difficult situations than, what, than this could ever potentially be. And so I think it is, given the constraints that the learned attorney general would have pointed out this morning, I think that we can manage this situation. I also believe that trying to find perfect solutions is an exercise in futility. As Christians, as a Christian, I believe that the journey, that reaching perfection is really a journey. A journey that will culminate at some point. But not to do anything while trying to get to perfection is not a situation that is tenable, not sustainable, doesn't make any sense. And so while this discussion is a challenging one, it speaks to norms and behavior, accepted behavior that we've grown accustomed to over years, that it is for some people difficult to get out of. Bring this bill to this honorable chamber speaks to a government that is not afraid to tackle the difficult situations, a government that is not afraid to address difficult issues, a government that is not afraid to go against the green when the green impacts negatively people's rights, especially their religious rights. And so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as the minister responsible for social justice, I want to say that this bill before this honorable chamber today is a victory for the process and the progress of social justice in Barbados. This is part of that effort to ensure that people's rights are not trampled because of any of, of their looks or their views or, or, or what they practice. This is a tangible expression, a tangible expression that this government is committed to removing all barriers to discrimination of any sector or any group of people in this country. This is the government that I'm a part of. This is the party in office that I am happy to be a part of. A government that says to its people, all of you and all of us have rights. Once those rights do not infringe other people's rights, we have the right to practice. Long live social justice in Barbados, and long live the march to achieving that end of ensuring that all of our people are free, not discriminated against, and are able in their own way to contribute to the development of this country that they love so much. I'm obliged to you. Honourable right. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise to bring closure to this bill, this debate, and do so with pride. I do so with pride because fundamentally, the bill that is before this honorable chamber is really one that is intended to deal with the mission for inclusiveness and the mission for a free and fair society that is non-discriminatory. A society that values our own that allows us in the language of the father of independence in the month of independence to love our mirror image as he asked us in 1986, what mirror image do we have of ourselves? Mm -hmm. And we have come to this point as a nation on the eve of our 53rd anniversary of independence, conscious that as I said one week ago exactly at the same time, in the Parliament of Ghana, that we have come to accept and love ourselves 
for who we are rather than to be defined by others. We live in a society that values the service clubs of the Kiwanis and the JCs and the Lions, but there are some who still are yet to value the oldest service club in Barbados, the Barbados Landship. We live in a society that prior to my introduction as Minister of Education, as to the practices of the land shipping to the schools of this country, our school children knew nothing at all about the Barbados land ship. And I trust and pray that the checks program which we started, which is well known to many on this side, would continue. We live in a society that finds it difficult to reconcile that freedom fighters can be black, they got to be rioters. And it was this government that put on a pedestal Clement Payne, Israel Lovell, men and women in this country who did nothing more than to fight for the right to self-determination, but who because of the laws of the day were deemed to be criminals and to be participating in seditious activity and treasonous activity. Men lost their liberty, men lost their lives because a society constructed from the 17th century became the first modern racial society Last Friday, I had cause in the Parliament of Ghana to refer to the rebellion that failed, led by King Kofi, an Akan-speaking slave. Evidence being revealed today that hitherto not even at the time of the passage of our national heroes legislation was well known or popularized to the people of this country. Because we all believed that the first attempt at rebellion in a modern Barbados, and I keep saying modern Barbados because they were indigenous Indians that lived here before the British came, before the Africans came. But in 1816, we believed that the Bustle Revolt was the first attempt to assert oneself without realizing that prior to that, as early as within 50 years of settlement, the Africans that were brought here were resisting the exclusion, the exploitation, and the domination by numbers of persons who were lesser in count than a number of Africans, but who controlled military power and the power of parliament. I say today that it is a good and delightful thing that the parliament that could have passed slave laws to restrict freedoms, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, can now be a post-independent parliament that removes the discriminatory practices that transforms a parliament from being a tool of oppression to an instrument of empowerment and fairness in this land. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is easy to say these words, but if you look at others in the region and the extent to which laws remain, laws and discriminate against women passing on their right of citizenship to their children, discriminating against people who want to practice their own religion. I know what it is to be a lawyer practicing criminal law in this country and to have had clients on remand, 
to be found innocent when the trial was finished, but to have had themselves shaved of their locks before the determination of innocence was returned in our law courts. Mercifully, that practice did not require a law to be changed. And through enlightened leadership at the level of administrations, the policy changed. So we are here today, sir, to give effect to a determination by this party, which I have the honor to lead, that when we met, and I trust and pray that the Honorable Leader of the Opposition is of the same view, that when we met, and in May 2016, we went to the headquarters of our sister institution, at Solidarity House on that evening. And many of you did us the honor of sharing the precepts and principles in the covenant of hope, our covenant of hope. The possessive pronoun should not escape you because we were not prepared to use the definite article. We wanted to own it. We didn't want it to be something that moves from party to party to party to party, principle to principle. We wanted to own this. And we said that we shall forever be known because you can with clarity and certainty understand who we are, what we stand for, and what we shall fight for. And in that document, sir, the very, 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 very first principle that the Barbados Labour Party stood for. Somebody get injured. The Barbados Labour Party stands for strengthening the spiritual and cultural psyche of Barbadians in a way that enhances honesty and integrity, raises self-awareness, builds confidence and pride, fosters a sense of industry and responsibility, community and nationalism. And at principle nine, the Barbados Labour Party stands for fostering civility, inclusiveness, and respect for diversity amongst our citizens. On the next page, opposite in the wall of values, look at it there at the very bottom. One may even say it was anchoring all of the other values because a society that knows what it is to have its members be a victim of discrimination should not be guilty of the very same act of discrimination against its own members. That would otherwise be known as hypocrisy. And if we are therefore to be true to the principles that those men and women that went before us fought for. It mustn't only be the principles that are convenient to us. As I say all the time, principles only mean something when it is inconvenient to stand by them. I can think of no better expression than that laid out by the previous speaker, the Honorable Member for St. Peter, who reminded us that there are people in Barbados who would still want to assault the religion to which he belongs as a cult simply because they choose to practice their religion from as a Sabbath that is a Saturday and I must tell you that even along the route and he would tell you too if he is pressed that there are those who would have wanted me to insist that a member for St. Peter come to hear me as leader of the Barbados Labour Party address annual conferences Saturday after Saturday after Saturday at 4.30 in the afternoon and to disrespect his religion just simply to be present.
for that occasion. And I said, I would love to see my brother. I would love to stand up next to the tall man. But the truth is that principles only mean something when it is inconvenient to stand by them. And while I may not be of the Seventh-day Adventist faith, my secretary is, my MP is, people who I respect are. And I have a duty to respect their faith, even when the leader of the opposition as bishop served with us. On many occasions, he had to tour the region with respect to his regional responsibilities as bishop of his faith within the region. And his party then accommodated it. Because fundamentally, we are born of a movement that understood that the fight against discrimination had to be on all fronts. And I say all the time, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that at the age of 53, as this nation is, you have to be accustomed to difficult conversations. Life is not in a straight line. And were it that we could do things that don't have pros and cons, might be in fact blasphemous because it would be meaning that we are purporting to be divine. <laughs> and we're not. But what we do know is that there are certain principles that are worth standing for. Now, I go to the manifesto. Uh, and before I go, I remind us that the fact that the first goal and vision espoused in this covenant of hope was for a new national consciousness is because we are conscious that we still live even with the majority of the laws being repealed, except for this one, which we are seeking to perfect today. But we still live in a society where our minds have been penetrated by concepts and images that are intended to tell us we are inferior. There is a great book called The Racial Contract by a Jamaican called Charles Mills, a distinguished academic. Indeed, I believe he gave a lecture some years ago in this country. And he made the point that when the Europeans determined that they wanted to conquer this part of the world, the first thing they did in order to extract wealth was to go for the Indians who were indigenous. And when they could not survive, they then went to Africa to be able to start the extraction of labor. And Mr. Speaker, I would be telling you a lie if I did not admit that the visit last Thursday to the Cape Coast is one of the most emotionally disturbing events of my entire life. To stand in those dungeons where over 200 people were forced to stand with one window to the top. No, 200 people at a time. A room that is not even really from here to that wall, from that wall no further than the Attorney General. In it they ate. In it, they defecated. In it, they urinated. In it, they slept. In it, they recovered. In it, they kept care of one another. And all they had was a little, 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 little channel down the middle so that sometimes they could come in and wash. The Ghanaians told us that after the last slaves were kept in that room, when they opened it up decades later, all of what was defecated were still remnants on the wall. And then they took us when we went to the burial, yes. 
to do with the remnants. And the symbolism of it will never leave me. And I'm glad that members of the Rastafarian faith were able to accompany us at a night and Lucille Trotman and others on that trip. We didn't go and leave them out. And for the record, the business people who went paid for themselves. They took us to Asin Manso where we did the burial. But the importance of that was not only where they buried others from Jamaica and the United States. They then took us, and I must confess, I prayed because <laughs> the ground was wet, the leaves were slippery, the mud was even slipperier. And we walking down this path to the river. And when you got to the river, the main river, the currents were flowing strong. But there was a little piece off to the side that was like a pond. And then we learned the horror that they would take the people who would become slaves and put them in that little pond to clean them. And they would take the bamboo and they would use the bamboo and rub and scrub them and scrub them and scrub them and the blood would flow. I have a bottle of the river water now that I keep and I have it next to my bed. A country that is built on the premise of racism and inferiority cannot in the modern 21st century against the background of self-determination seek to be discriminating against anybody for any reason. And I am happy as the eighth prime minister of this nation to lead a government to bring justice and righteousness and non-discrimination to brothers and sisters in our country who have been the victims of discrimination for simply wanting to practice their faith. This government didn't stop there though. On page 19, and I was telling, let me, before I get that, let me go back to Charles Mills. Because when they could no longer sustain the argument that black people were not human, which was the first argument, ironically, practiced not only by the governments and the traders, but by the religions of the day who were powerful. And they said that your forebears and mine were not human. And when they could no longer sustain that argument, they then said, well, they're human, but they're inferior. The, the, the brain is not appropriately developed. They can't think properly. They can't be responsible for themselves. And you start to see the movement then from slavery to colonialism. Where we must be responsible for their affairs. And when, as we moved into the 20th century and the member of St. Michael East spoke about the partitioning of Africa. And can I tell you in this parliament that one week ago represented the 135th anniversary of the starting of the conference by Bismarck to be able to partition Africa irrespective of the tribes that they were splitting, irrespective of the consequences that they would bring to people, trying to put people together who didn't even speak the same language. This notion that all black people look alike and all black people speak the same language. Nonsense. There's so many languages in Ghana alone. There's so many languages in Suriname. And what we have was then an experiment in colonialism, and ironically, the first black country to become independent, the first sub-Saharan African country to become independent, was Ghana under the distinguished leadership of Kwame Nkrumah, 
whose mausoleum and museum we had the honor of visiting and paying tribute to last Friday morning. Ironically, just as Ghana was the first African country to become independent, when Barbados became independent 53 years ago this month, shy of eight days today, we became the smallest nation in the world ever to declare that it had the confidence in itself to govern our affairs. So Mr. Speaker, when the colonial experiment was deconstructed, we ended up with one problem. That the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights appropriately conferred on us the dignity of agency, each of us. But in so doing, it preserved the imbalance in power, the imbalance in access to resources, the imbalance in all of those things that have fundamentally given oxygen to the movement for reparations in today's world. And while I will not get into that in detail today, Barbados chairs the CARICOM Commission on Reparations. And there is no doubt that the century's extraction of wealth from our part of the world secured the foundation for an industrial power for most of the North Atlantic countries just as it underdeveloped the Caribbean and Africa, as Walter Rodney so brilliantly wrote. But the problem, the problem goes beyond the laws. The problem also goes to the continued determination that you undermine the sense of confidence needed by these people, our people, by referring to everything that is black as negative. Remember for Christchurch, East Central will go instead of me next week to the OECD in the hope that in our continued engagement that this notion of blacklisting will not happen to us. And the very list being called a black list is as offensive as it can get, adding salt to the injury that is given to us economically and financially to our companies. The notion that thick lips or hair that is not straight, how many families in this country have had their grandchildren and children told, don't stand up too long in the summer because you're going to get too dark. The sun, too hot, you're going to get too dark. Without understanding that the purity and the beauty of blackness ought to be celebrated. I have an uncle who, to his credit, remain steadfast in his support for empowering black people in this country and in the wider region and in the Pan-African arena. He knows what it is to be ostracized in the land of his birth. And if I have a sensitivity, it may well be because I saw what it did to him all because he believed that he could have a social experiment in a community-based organization called Yoruba in Fontabelle that took many a young boy and girl and treated them as being relevant and desirable to learn. They brought in drummers from Africa, West Africa. They brought in dance instructors from West Africa. I can still remember most of them as a little girl, running around them, playing on the drums. 
hearing all kinds of stories, hearing men and women talk to me in different accents. That didn't sound like anything from around here. But they had a sense of pride. And there was a nobility to them. There are those who would ask me about my hair. Ironically, I got it pulled back today. But the notion that you only look presentable if your hair is straightened. I don't have a problem with anybody straightening their hair, but if I don't want to do that, that's my business. Yeah. If I'm comfortable with who I am, as I am, that's me. And that sense of confidence is the most important gift we can give our children in this country. We want global citizens with Bajan roots. Then let us root them. Let us look in the mirror and love who we see. But when your father is a Rastafarian and you then see the police come and grab up your father and carry him down to the main guard and a magistrate in a bad mood for the morning one particular morning decide that hmm, I don't like how he look, I don't like how he answer me go up for seven days, come back down in seven days don't tell me that these things don't happen. I know. Because I have been present on too many occasions. It is true that the society has become more tolerant now. And some of the penalties are not now in the norm. And that's perhaps why it is easier to begin to reason with people that these things are wrong. And it's not me saying so. When we were doing the medicinal cannabis bill, I read from you and I want the executive summary published for the benefit of all Barbadians. And this is a bill, let us not fool ourselves. I mean, a report. Look who was on the report and I repeat it for this debate. Professor Rosemary Bellantoine, a professor of law at Cave Hill. University of the West Indies, no less than the wife of the former Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Kenny Anthony. Professor Wendell Abel, a consultant psychiatrist at the University Hospital of the West Indies at Mona. A doctor of medicine and psychiatry. Masters in public health from Johns Hopkins, one of the preeminent medical schools in the Western Hemisphere. Esther Bess, Manager of the National Drug Council of Trinidad and Tobago, the equivalent of the National Council of Substance Abuse in Barbados. Fact, Franklin Lennox Francis, or better known as Ras Frankay Tafari, the ambassador of Antigua and Barbuda to Ethiopia. Dr. Alana Griffith, a lecturer in sociology, a Barbadian young lady, bright lecturer at Cave Hill, Dr. Maxine Gossel williams a senior lecturer in pharmacology and pharmacy at UWI Mona campus, the retired bishop, I'm not sure if this bishop is retired too, so if he might tell me <laughs> how I should refer to him, should it be bishop retired as it is written, or retired bishop? I'm not sure, because always once a bishop, always a bishop. <laughs> So Bishop Simeon Hall, presently serving as the pastor emeritus of the New Covenant Baptist Church and moderator emeritus of the Bethel Baptist Association, leading and has led several, in fact, numerous evangelistic and mission exercises around the world, preaching in all of the islands of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, in every major island in the Caribbean, in 48 states of the USA, Canada, South Africa, Malaysia, Singapore, Beijing, London, Australia, and many of the European and South American countries. A distinguished religious man. Mr. Dorma Harrison, the law enforcement specialist in the Institute of Criminal Justice and Security at the UWI. Dr. Kishore Shallow, 
a doctorate in business administration, and an MBA, a preeminent voice for young people across the Caribbean, who is now, was then the Vice Dean of the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors. I refer to this because this report made clear a number of things, and the executive summary is sufficient for those who don't want to read the full report. But it made the point that the history of the illegality of cannabis in the Caribbean is less than 100 years old in most nations. There are people older than me who will tell you about soursop leaf tea and other bush tea that acted as hallucinogenics or acted as anti-inflammatory medicine. But all because the United States of America and a few determined that these things were to be part and parcel of a puritanical approach to be able to preserve the dominance of others in other areas of commerce. Alcohol first and this were deemed illegal. Mr. Speaker, sir, there is no doubt that alcohol is not good for young children. There is equally no doubt that cannabis or smoking cigarettes is not good for young children. Let us be clear about it. And any attempt to be able to provide for either medicinal cannabis or sacramental cannabis is not an invitation for young people to be involved. And we will do our best to make sure that all Barbadians take responsibility for protecting our young people. But the fact that it is not good for young people to drink alcohol has not stopped this country from selling alcohol from St. Lucie to St. Philip, from St. James to St. John, from St. Michael to St. Joseph. Because we understand that there are certain things that young people should not do, there are certain things that old people shouldn't do. <laughs> There's a time and season for everything. And we have to be able to manage our families, manage our communities, and manage our countries in a way that is sensitive to these things. But I want to say this, that this debate fundamentally for me, therefore, is a debate about inclusiveness and fairness. And in our manifesto at page 19, we specifically had a section for our Rastafarian brethren and sistren. And we said then, that we recognize and respect the members of the Rastafarian community as valued and contributing members to the Barbadian society. We will facilitate access for them for land. The Minister of Agriculture is in the process of completing the transfer of the land to them to be able to do farming in the land of their birth in the parish of St. John. I know what it is as Minister of Culture back in 1999-2000 to facilitate a regional ISIS, which was the conference of all the Rastafarian brethren and sistren coming here. And this is long before any tolerance level. But we as a society understood that we had to start the process of being inclusive. For many years, I would go down to Temple Yard, especially in the last 18 months before they stop these concerts. And I'd see all kinds of people, senior public servants doing poetry in Temple Yard on a Sunday night. Member for St. Michael South went with me on one occasion. So that I didn't need anybody to come and tell me that down there didn't have electricity or water. I saw it myself. Right. And one of the first things we did as a government was to say that it is wrong. You know what a blessed country this is, Mr. Deputy Speaker? You know that there are many other countries that if in the heart of town you had a location where hundreds of people gathered on a daily basis who were excluded from water and light, that in many other countries it wouldn't end so. And the last government ignored them. Mm. 
for four or five years after they had the fire. Well, I'm happy to say that between the Ministry of Public Works and Maintenance and the Urban Development Commission, that work has started and is largely completed. But we are going further because we believe that the upgrades, the removal of the butcher shop to the front, that burnt, that stands there derelict, that that needs to come down. We need to have a proper entrance. We need to have proper landscaping with them helping to design it. I went there myself and told them that this is what we are going to do. I didn't call the press to go. I don't need the press to do the right thing in this country. We have to do right by people. And I may be attacked for many things, but I am going to do right by the people because the people gave us a mandate, and the mandate is in this manifesto to do these things. From Temple Yard, back to the provision of land, back to the non-discriminatory practices that we need to foster, to the inclusive approach. So my colleagues and myself will remain faithful to that mission. As to those who are asking about recreational cannabis, let me be very clear, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We said in this same manifesto that we were going to legalize medicinal cannabis and that we would go to referendum. We would go to referendum on recreational cannabis. Right. Mr. Speaker, it is to my knowledge that the leader of the Democratic Labour Party supports the decriminalization or legalization of recreational cannabis. The leader of the opposition and myself have spoken, and it is for him to speak for himself. But I am confident that the truth is that there is far more consensus on these issues in this country than exists, than people might think. But in spite of the consensus at the political level, our party took a view that as a matter of governance, that 30 people sitting in a parliament cannot bind societies to fundamental change on certain wedge issues, and that we would not take action in advance of consulting the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, it is in our manifesto. People voted for it. And as the member for St. Peter said, we remain steadfastly faithful to what the people voted for in our manifesto. To that extent, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at a point in the future, all Barbadians will have a chance, one Sunday afternoon or one afternoon in the week, possibly, so as not to get into anyone's sacrament on a Sunday, a day in the week, to be able to go and to vote. And they'll have the chance to say, yes, it should be decriminalized. No, it should not be decriminalized. And like with everything else, we shall live by the results of that verdict. Without prejudice to that, the Attorney General has expressed his concern, as I have too, that it is taking up too much space in our criminal courts. And in fact, the government of Trinidad and Tobago would have just as a cabinet passed legislation to decriminalize, they are not going to referendum, they're going straight. And that they are introducing into parliament legislation to deal with this. Jamaica has. Antigua has. St. Vincent has done sacramental and medicinal like us, but they are going to look at how best to remove the criminal blockages and penalties that are making too many of our citizens convicted criminals rather than dealing with this as a public health issue if the addiction is really there. So this government will continue the path 
in a very measured and orderly way as we indicated to the people of this country. But today, one week shy of our nation's 53rd anniversary of independence, we seek to remove the stain and the discrimination against too many of our citizens, thousands of them, across these 11 parishes. Yes, there are some who have locks who are not rasters, but there are also people without locks who are rasters. Let us be clear. There's no exam to tell you whether you're an Anglican or a Baptist. It's an article of faith. It's a matter of mutual self-respect. And Mr. Speaker, sir, one of the things that stood out last week is that institutions in their historical development have sometimes not always stood for the right things. This parliament was once a tool of oppression, a tool of tyranny. Today it stands of an, as an instrument of empowerment and social justice. Last week, Thursday, when I visited the Cape Coast Castle, it shook me to learn that above the dungeon stood the location where the priests occupied for a very long time. And the church, mercifully, has changed its position on what its views are as to who is human and who deserves dignity of agency from what it was saying years ago, centuries ago. And they felt that way still in the 18th century, even though the great James Madison in 1785 delivered himself of these words. The religion then of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man. And it is the right of every man to exercise it as these may dictate. So at one level, there were people espousing that. But at another level, the institutions of society from parliament to the church to commerce were precluding mainstream participation for the citizens of their nation. I am proud to stand here today as leader of this nation, as a prime minister of the Caribbean community, to have a commission led by those eminent citizens say to us, as they did, that The Commission believes that the end goal of CARICOM should be the dismantling of prohibition in its totality to be replaced by a strictly regulated framework akin to that for alcohol and tobacco, which are harmful substances that are not criminalized. But I say that while we may believe at an individual level, as many of us do, that the greatest precept that a government must adhere to in the 21st century is not that it is all things to all people, but it stands in trust to exercise the powers on behalf of its people and that in so doing, its role is to facilitate the governance of the nation rather than being the absolute government to dictate to everybody everything. This is the democracy precepts. These are the precepts of democracy that the founders of this great party fought for as they came out of the turbulence of the 1937 revolution right here in the city of Bridgetown from Golden Square. So Mr. Speaker, I ask this honorable chamber as others will ask in the other place, for us to stand united 
in ensuring that there is no remnant of discriminatory practice for a sect that is completely Barbadian, born here, practicing their faith here, a faith that is Caribbean in origin, but regrettably, for too many decades in our post-1930s history, been treated as outcasts in their own lands. They may reflect positively that that is how some treated Jesus in his own time. But they can celebrate that decades of conscious raising advocacy on their part through academic institutions, through the language and literature of our times, namely the lyrics and music of our time, through engagement in our schools, through engagement in our corridors of government and in our parliaments, that the sun is now rising on their ability to practice their faith in the land of their birth. Let us give thanks for this moment. May we now solemnize it by agreeing that this bill be read a second time. I'm obliged to Can we have a second, please? The question is that this bill be read a second time. All the members in favor say aye. Those against say no. We think the ayes have it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move the appointment of the Honorable Member for Christchurch South uh, uh, to be acting chairman, chairman of committees. We have, the question is that the member for, Sin, for Christchurch South be appointed as, the, as, uh, be, as be appointed as chairman of committees. All members in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The member for Christchurch South will now be chairman. Now you got to beg that. Um, member for the city, you got to ask that he leave the chair so he can. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that you do now leave the chair and that the House resolve itself in the committee for further consideration of this bill. The question is that I do now leave the chair and then our member becomes chairman of committees. All the members in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Nigel, I want to make a slight amendment. I want to make a slight amendment here from 12 to 40. Yeah. House is now in committee. Clause one. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Acting Chairman, I beg to move that clause one, stand part. The question is that clause one now stand part. All honorable members who favor this, please say yes. Aye. Yes. And all honorable members who are against this, please say no. Seems that the affirmations are unanimous. <laughs> clause two. <laughs> Mr. Acting Chairman, I beg to move that clause two stand part. Question is that clause two now stand part. All our other members in favor, please say yes. 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 <laughs> All honorable members against, please say no. It seems that the affirmations are unanimous. Clause three. Beg to move, sir, that clause three stand part. 
question is that Clause 3 now stand for. All honourable members, in favour, please say yes. All honourable members against, please say no. It appears as if the affirmations are unanimous. Clause 4. Beg to move that Clause 4 stand for. Question is that Clause 4 now stand for. All honourable members in favour, please say yes. yes. All honourable members against, please say no. It appears that the affirmations are again unanimous. Clause 5. Uh, Mr. Chairman, beg to move that Clause 5 stand for. I beg to second that. The question is that Clause 5 now stand for. All honourable members in favour, please say yes. Yes. All our honourable members against, please say no. It appears as if the affirmations are unanimous. Clause 6. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I propose to make a very slight amendment to Clause 6. I indicated to the Chamber, as I gave my second reading speech, that um, so as not to have a lacuna or void between the amount stipulated and the traficable quantity which is set at 15 grams. Could you speak up, please? Yes. Yes, thank you. I wasn't hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, the, Ms. Acton, Chairman, the proposed amendment is to Clause 6.4 and 6.4b, where it is proposed that the number 14 as in 14 grams, be substituted for the number 12 grams. Sir, a trafficable amount is 15 grams or more. So you would have had um, a, a space between this amount yes. and a trafficable amount, so that a person who had then 13 grams would have found themselves running a foul of the law in circumstances where that clearly was not the intention. Yes. Uh, we had to choose a figure, and I think that for consistency, it would make sense to stipulate a, a figure of, a figure that is below 15, but not, not, but so the figure I'm proposing we amend to is to say 14 grams. 14. Yes, sir. Speaking of that matter, Mr. Chair, Acting Chair, I had raised a query for clarity as to whether or not the amounts indicated in Section 6, as stated in the legislation proposed, uh, are intended to suggest that any individual attending an event in the circumstance of exemption any individual is allowed to carry the 12 ounces, or does that refer to the person holding the permit? Graham, sorry. Uh, Mr. Mr. Acting Chairman, if you look at Clause 6.4b. Clause? 6.4. Yes. It says a permit granted under subsection 2 shall give permission for persons attending the exempt event. So the, 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 the clear statement is for persons attending the exempt event. And, and your question is, honorable member, as to whether persons refers to any age? No, no, no. My question was whether or not the, the legislation is providing for any individual attending that exempt event to carry the 12, in this case I hear 14, grams of marijuana, or is it intended for the individual holding the permit for the event, as opposed to everybody going to the event? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that the question as asked was answered. The plain meaning of 6-4 says persons attending the event. Do I understand you, Honorable Member for St. Michael West, to be wondering aloud whether that person is restricted to section three? Could you, could you draw yourself to sure, section no, no, three? No, 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 I think the honorable member of St. Joseph answered quite clearly the question. Anybody attending the event 
in that exempt circumstance, anybody mm -hmm. is entitled to carry 12 grams. And not a person referred not, to at Section 3. Clause not, 3, I beg your pardon. I'm not sure what you talk Section 3. I don't have the document the, before me. I'm talking Section could, 6. Could you clarify for the Honorable Member, uh, Honorable Member for St. Joseph? It's clear to me. Mr. Acting Chairman, the Honourable Member said that he clearly understands the answer. Any person. That I, he clearly understands the answer that I give. Uh, I'm mindful of the fact that we are doing this for the public's benefit. And uh, I'm asking Honourable Member whether person in Clause 6 is person defined at Clause 3, which means a person who is an adherent of the Rastafarian religion. Um, I think we need to clarify it. No, no I, Mr. Acting Chairman, a permit is applied for by the person. Clause 6, 1 says that a person in charge of a place of worship who is granted a permit may also make an application for an exempt event permit. Mm -hmm. yes. It only takes one person to make an application. Yes. Just like one person applies to keep a fet somewhere or another. Or, or a person applies to have an event in Queen's Park. Yes. That person, the applicant, is granted the exempt event permit. Yes. But the exemption is for the event. The exemption is for the event. So you're given an exempt event permit. So the exempt event, perhaps, then, would be a celebration of African Liberation Day held at, I don't know, pick a place, King George's Fifth Memorial Park. Yes. So that, that is given, that would be given an exempt event permit. The individuals who are going to be attending the event, any person, who is attending the exempt event mm -hmm. has the privilege, sir, as set, as set out in 6 4 B. So, yes. finally, I hope, Mr. Acting Chairman, I am hearing very clearly, it seems you are not. The Honorable Attorney General is saying permit has been granted for an exempt event to one individual, but any person on a 6 4 B, any person, that could be 500 persons, 1,000 persons attending the event, any person attending the event can carry up to 12 grams. That is my understanding. And I thought that's what he said. Chairman, I beg to move that section six as amended stand part. I insist we need clarity on this. I want to stand for this. Could you repeat your original question? Please. Let us settle this. And I thank you. Yes, please. I understand in an instance where someone who leads a faith group wants to have an exempt event, event away from the place of worship, usual place of worship, in a public place, they can apply for and get a permit for such purpose. No problem with that. Mm -hmm. so 4B, Mr. Chairman, Acting Chairman, then says, says very clearly, Mr. Chairman, a permit granted under Section 2 shall give to persons, shall give to persons attending the exempt event B, the privilege of transporting no more than 12 grams of cannabis to the public place being used for it. Now, I, I ask for clarity. And in the first two instances of reply, I understand, I understood the Attorney General be saying, anybody. And now I am confused again. Is it anybody or is it just a single person who holds the permit for the event? The question, Mr. therefore, is... Mr. Sorry, Mr. sorry, Honorable Member. The, as I understand it, the question, therefore, is whether at 6-4-B, uh, that person... This is B you're asking about, yeah. Honorable Member. Uh, is restricted to the person who is granted the permit or whether it includes all persons attending the event. Mr. 
Acting Chairman. Yes. The first rule of statutory interpretation is the literal rule. Just, just my, a second. Uh, we're my... clarifying. Like, sorry, sorry, Honorable Member. We are clarifying for this for the sake of the question raised. Yeah. Mr. Acting so let us Chairman. not argue on it. Let us let us resolve it. I don't think there's anything to resolve, sir. Okay, thank you. The, the clause clearly says it, the exempt permit shall give permission for persons attending the event. Persons is, first of all, plural, and it can therefore not be limited to the person who applies for the permit. Right. As I give the, I use the example when I did my second reading speech, when I said that we're not Harry Potter, you can't wave a magic wand and, and cannabis for sacramental purposes will appear in the middle of any place. The member for St. Peter said that he's never gone to a church where by some miraculous intervention, a bottle of communion wine, a bottle of um, grape, juice. A grape juice shows up in the midst of, of the congregation on the platform. We are practical people in a practical world, sir. The whole idea here is to is to respect and protect the privilege, the rights are not privileged, the right to practice your faith. And I come back to the first rule of statutory interpretation. It says, it says, shall give permission for persons attending the event. Persons. Persons. Sir, uh, we go back, we, we repeat in the same debate, a church like any other church will have events and they're going to invite they're going to invite people from the neighborhood people from from all over to come come to my church we are having a, a harvest we're having a a, a a something or another honorable member for northeast would you like to okay. mr acting chairman I will tell you. I don't like how you're pointing at me. <laughs> well, I will tell you, Mr. Acton Chairman. I will tell you, Mr. Acton Chairman, that I understand yes, yes. Just the make honorable point. member from St. In Joseph to be saying yes. that were you to be leading a faith group and were you to have applied for a permit for an exempt event and that permit were granted to you, when that event is held, all those persons coming with you and to attend that event will be allowed to carry up to 12 grams of marijuana. That is what I understand. So, Mr. Chairman, I don't understand that all 500 people have to apply? Honorable Member for St. Joseph. Is, I'm not gallery. I am is, 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 is your answer consistent with what the Honourable Member for St. Michael Mr. Northeast is Mr. saying? Mr. Just, just give the answer let's press Mr. on, Mr. Acting Chairman, I've already given the answer three Thank or four times, much. sir. I beg to move that section, that Clause 6, down part. I beg to second that. Mr. Acting Chair. Is there a could, motion? Mr. Acting Chair, could I hear from you as to what you understand to be the Honourable Member's and position it, on this on matter? On the point of order, Mr. Speaker, well, on the point of order, Mr. Acting Chairman, <laughs> the Leader of the Opposition has a total misconception of the role of an Acting Chairman, of any yeah. Chairman, well, in committee. The I, Chairman presides and rules. I, I was about to say that uh, it is not... I, I take it that the Honourable Member for St. Joseph is of the view that you do not know what your, rule, what your role <laughs> is. <laughs> no, I, I, he has stood to his feet on if, many if, occasions. If, if you don't mind. He has given different responses. I have an interpretation. In the interest of clarity, just share with me what is yours. Help me out here. No. no. Uh, I, you, you have asked, Honourable Member, you have asked, and I, I, I have, I am doing this fairly and fearlessly be assured of that. And uh, you have asked the question, the Honorable Member for St. Joseph has supplied an answer. He supplied an answer, and uh, the legislation will stand or fall on what the Honorable Member has answered you with. Thank you. Could you press on? 
Please put it again, honorable member. Let's, let's do this properly. Beg to move that clause six as amended stand par. Question is that clause six now stand par. All honorable members in favor, please say yes. Aye. Against, please say no. It seems as if the affirmations are unanimous. Clause seven. Member. Beg to move that clause seven stand par. Question is that clause seven now stand par. All those in favor say yes. All those against say no. It seems as if the affirmations are unanimous. Clause eight. Move that clause eight stand par. Question is that clause eight now stand par. All honorable members in favor, please say yes. All those Aye. against, please say no. It seems as if the affirmations are unanimous. Clause nine. Question is that clause nine now stand part. All those in favor, please say yes. Aye. All those against, please say no. It seems as if the affirmations are unanimous. Clause 10. Member. Beg to move the clause 10 stand part. Oh. Question is that clause 10 now stand part. All those in favor, please say yes. All those against, please say no. Yes. Yes. Did I hear any yeses? Yes. Thank you. Seems as if the yeses are in the majority. Well, it's unanimous. Same answer. You just don't want. Uh, persons. Members, could answer. we do this uh, orderly? Beg move that clause 11 stand part. Thank you. Question persons. is that clause 11 now stand part. All those in favor, please say yes. All those against, please say no. Appears as if the affirmations are unanimous. Clause 12. I beg to move that clause 12 stand part. Question is that clause 12 now stand part. All those in favor, please say yes. All those against, please say no. It appears as if the affirmations are unanimous. Member? Clause 6. I beg to move that clause 13 stand part. Question is that clause 13 now stand part. All those in favor, please say yes. All those against, please say no. Appears as if the affirmations are unanimous. Clause 14. That clause 14 stand part. Question is that clause 14 now stand part. All those in favor, please say yes. All those against, please say no. Affirmations are unanimous. Clause 15. Member? Make move that clause 15 stand part. Question is that clause 15 now stand part. All those in favor, please say yes. All those against, please say no. Appears as if the Affirmations are unanimous. The first schedule. Beg to move that the first schedule be the schedule to the bill. Be the Question is that the first schedule be the schedule to the bill. All those in favor, please say yes. All those against, please say no. The affirmations are unanimous. Second schedule. Beg to move that the second schedule be the second schedule to the bill. Question is that the second schedule be the schedule, second schedule to the bill. All those in favor, please say yes. All those against, please say no. The affirmations are unanimous. Report. I beg to move, sir, that you do not report to his honor, the deputy speaker, the passing of one bill in committee. Question is that I now report to his honor the passing of one bill. All those in favor, please say yes. All those against, please say no. The affirmations are unanimous. Thank you very much. Where is he? Chairman of committees have reported to me the passing of one bill in committee. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be read a third time. The question is that this bill be read a third time. All the members in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. Me thinks the ayes have it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that this bill do not pass and be cited the Sacramental Cannabis Act 2019. The question is that this bill be no pass and be so cited. All members in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. Me think the ayes have it. This bill is now passed and so cited.
order number 12 on the order paper. Order number 12 in the name of the Honor Leader Senate to move that the House resolve. What? Sorry. Sorry. The Honor Member of the Senate, the House, to move that the House resolve itself into Standing Finance Committee, consider the grant of sums of money for the service of the island. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that the House resolve itself into Committee of Supply. Seconded. And that you do now lead the chair. Okay. Seconded, please. Thank you, second. Okay. The question is that I do now leave the chair and this House resolve itself in the Standard Finance Committee. All members in favor say aye. Those against say no. We think the ayes have it. is now in committee. House to, to move the pass on the resolution to grant the sum of two million nine hundred fifty thousand dollars from the consolidated fund and to place it at the disposal of the public to supplement the estimates 2019-2020 as shown in the submit estimates number seven of 2019-2010-20, which form the schedule to the resolution. Mr. Acting Chair. Yes, please. Um, I beg to move that order number seven, 2020, the, that was um, delayed, be withdrawn and be replaced by new order number seven. Put that. For the sum of one million eight hundred thousand dollars. The question is that the one million eight 